Welcome to our first video in our series on cost volume profit analysis. This will be a four part series with this video providing an introduction to CVP analysis. The next video will discuss the mathematical approach to CVP. Part three will then cover multi product CVP, while the final video in the series will cover operating leverage. So, what are our learning objectives for this video? First, we will discuss what CVP analysis is and how it can help us in business. We will then understand what is meant by the term break-even. We will then look at the economist viewpoint of CVP analysis. After this, we will simplify this viewpoint to arrive at our break-even and profit volume graphs. Finally, we will review the underlying assumptions, which allow us to simplify the economist viewpoint. So what is CVP analysis and how does it help us? CVP is an important tool used for decision making. It helps managers to understand and compare the consequences of different courses of action. This is achieved because CVP examines the relationship between changes in activity or units sold, changes in selling prices, changes in costs, and their effect on net profit. Thus, it allows us to predict what will happen when various changes occur in our business. CVP analysis can help us as it enables us to answer many important questions, including, but not limited to, the number of units to be sold to break even, the effect on net profit if we change our selling price, the effect on net profit of changing our sales volume, the additional number of units to be sold if we need to meet additional fixed expenditure, or the additional units to be sold if we need to meet a specified profit target. Now, one of the questions that was asked on the previous slide was how many units do we need to sell in order to break even? The concept of break even is important in CVP analysis. It refers to the output level where total revenue is equal to our total cost. Remember here that total cost includes both variable and fixed costs. Now, if total revenue equals total costs, then it means our net profit will be zero. Now let us consider the economist's view of the relationship between costs and revenues. We will depict this on a graph with the x-axis representing the quantity of units sold and the y-axis representing the RAND value. If we begin with revenues, we see a graph that starts at zero, initially increases before hitting a turning point and starting to decrease. Let us understand why the graph does this. It begins at zero because we are not selling anything. As we sell more of our product, so our total revenue would increase. However, if we want to continuously increase the quantity sold, we will need to start dropping the price. The reason for this is linked to supply and demand. If supply is increasing, we need to drop the price in order to stimulate demand. Eventually, the decrease in price will outweigh the increased revenue from selling an extra unit, and our total revenue will begin to decline. Next, let us look at our costs. Unlike revenue, our costs start partway up the y-axis. This is because even if we are not selling anything, we will incur our fixed costs. Our total cost curve then increases at a decreasing rate, flattens out, and then increases again, but at an increasing rate. So why does it do this? As we start selling items, we start incurring variable costs. Initially, the curve increases at a decreasing rate as we move towards economies of scale. We then reach our optimal production level, which is where the curve has a turning point. After this, we have diseconomies, as producing more units now requires extra costs, such as more machine maintenance and overtime. Now that we have understood what the graph looks like, let us consider the important points on the graph. First, you will notice that there are two points where the total revenue line crosses the total cost line. At these two points, revenues and costs are equal, meaning that we have a net profit of zero. These are our break-even points. 
you will then notice that there are two areas where the total cost line is above the total revenue line. In these areas, we would be incurring losses. Finally, there's one area where the total revenue line exceeds the cost line. In this area, we will be achieving a profit. Now, dealing with curvy linear lines can be challenging from a mathematical perspective. So to simplify the economist's viewpoint, we use straight line graphs, as shown on screen. To achieve these straight lines, we must make various assumptions, which we will discuss towards the end of this video. The consequence of these assumptions are that we now only have one point where our total revenue and total costs are equal. This is our break-even point on the graph. After the break-even point, our revenue exceeds our costs, so we make profits. Before the break-even point, our costs exceed our revenue, so we incur losses. Next, we have our profit volume graph. This graph plots only one line on the set of axes, being our total profit line. Remember, the total profit is simply calculated as our total revenue less our total costs. In this graph, the x-axis represents a zero profit. So where the total profit line crosses the x-axis, it represents our break-even point. When the total profits line is above the x-axis, it means we are making profits. But when it is below the x-axis, it means we are incurring losses. You will also notice that where the total profit line meets the y-axis, this will represent our total fixed costs. Now, as I mentioned earlier, to achieve the simplified accountant's viewpoint, we need to make a number of assumptions. Let us go through these assumptions and their relevance for CVP analysis. Our first assumption is that all other variables remain constant. This is important as it allows us to change one variable at a time and therefore understand the impact of each individual component of the analysis separately. Our second assumption is that we have a single or a constant sales mix. Using a single product or constant sales mix allows us to have a constant contribution and is related to the importance of the first assumption. Third, we assume that revenues and costs are linear functions of output. This helps us to avoid the complications of the curvy linear nature depicted by economists. However, it is also related to our fourth assumption, that the analysis only applies to the relevant range. It is incorrect to project the CVP analysis outside the relevant range, because as we saw in the economist viewpoint, outside the relevant range, the nature of our cost and revenue relationships can no longer be expected to remain linear. Our fifth assumption is that we use a variable costing basis. Variable costing is generally considered superior for decision making. It also means that our profits are a function of sales only, which simplifies our analysis. Absorption costing can be used if we assume that production and sales are equal, or else we will need to incorporate the effect of changing production levels on our profits. Our sixth assumption is that the costs can be accurately divided into their fixed and variable elements. This enables us to correctly classify the costs and perform the analysis. Our final assumption is that the analysis applies in the short term only. In the long term, significant changes can take place to all elements in the analysis, making it inappropriate to use. These assumptions are critical when performing a CVP analysis. If the assumptions are broken, it means that our CVP analysis will not hold true. This brings us to the end of our introduction to CVP analysis. Join us in our next video as we consider the mathematical approach to CVP. Thank you.